Uh, welcome everybody, Office Hours with Arbitrage, Season 3. I think this is Episode 2. I want to thank you for hopping on today, Michael Oliver, because A, I didn't have anybody to interview, but then you dropped this target column on us, and I was like, oh, I'm safe. I'm safe. Because that's very interesting. In fact, we've talked about it a bit in the Daily Scores and Chill past few days. And so <laughs> why don't you give us like a five minute rundown of what you've been working on? And then we can spitball. <laughs> sure. So uh, one of my, I mean, one of my main goals for this quarter is to try to improve the sh like returns and sharp of our hedge fund, or at least the predicted ones based on our testing. Um, and I've tried a bunch of things and uh, I eventually came to the conclusion that in, in order to make big, uh, big changes, in, um, in order to improve things a lot, we have to change the data. Because uh, the, uh, the data that we give you guys is obviously obfuscated and regularized um, and uh, perhaps in some ways too regularized. And so this uh, new target is an attempt to maybe to sort of back off on some of the regularization a little bit um, and to better better match the fundamental signals that we care about. Um, and uh, and so, uh, yeah, so I've just been uh, just tweaking the target generation code and uh, seeing what effects that have. It's probably not surprising to anyone that small differences can lead to big effects. I can only <laughs> imagine. Yeah, and so uh, and so that's what th this was. This was uh, basically I uh, was able to train like a single model. Um, it's basically like one of the models I've staked with this uh, with uh, the new target versus old target, and it uh, led to better performance in back tests quite significantly. Um, and I can only imagine that like, basically it was it was getting higher predicted returns than the current meta model. Um, mm. Just alone by itself, yeah, that's... Just by itself, yeah. That's telling. Um, and so, uh, and then, so a meta model where everyone's using the new target would be even better, I think. So um, that's that's the sort of impetus for it. And then I was doing, we we're trying to figure out how how best to roll it out to you guys. And I was, I've been doing some experimentation to see uh, how close, um, if you train on the new target and predict on the old target, uh, and how that works. Um, and the correlations come out uh, like a, a model trained on one target and predicting on the other one, or basically a model trained on target, the current target and a model trained on the new target. Um, the model's predictions are pr highly correlated. Right. Um, like 96, 95% or so. Wow, but that yeah, little difference really... does make a difference. And so, uh, but your scores, uh, if you basically like us, uh, to roll it out initially, um, you can predict on target eight, even training the, on the new target. Um, and your scores basically on average look like their means come out about the same and the variance is a little bit reduced. Um, that's the... Well, it improves uh, your sharp so, then. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So um, you basically, by training on the new target, increase your sharp for free, uh, which is a nice property for, for the participants. Um, and, uh, and I wanted to uh, roll it out sort of to you guys sort of as soon as possible. Eventually we want to switch to scoring on it just to sort of force everyone to move over to it. Um, although even if you didn't, it would only hurt your scores a little bit. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, it wouldn't uh, hurt your scores terribly if you just decided to forego the transition. Um, but I think it is worth, it, it will be worth it um, to transition. Um, and uh, yeah, like the scores will basically uh, basically train on the new target and test on the new target. Uh, the sort of range of scores you'd get would basically be the same. Uh, in a model I had optimized the hyperparameters for the old target, um, it got bit, uh, much better sharp and slightly lower mean um, uh, on the new when predict uh, when applied to train on the new target and tested on the new target. Um, so. If I optimize for the new target, I, I think the scores would be even better, but probably higher mean and even better sharp. So on the so, potential rollout of the new target yeah. column, would that also include the target for the validation set as well? Uh, yeah, so uh, I was going to ask you about that. Uh, um, so for the initial re uh, release, I could do it either way. I, was, uh, I guess I'll just include the validation target as well so i was planning to just release a file with the training and validation data with the new target yeah i would i would 
personally want it wherever you provide the target to have it for each of those rows in both the training and the tournament file. Yeah, I, I know some people train on validation, so... I, I well, in this case, I, I'm removing my uh, my desire to train on the validation data. I just want to validate the models I have that do not use sure. validation data as, like, my own internal check to see how... if, if I improve or actually worsen. And that kind of leads to the, another question. I think it's, it's also probably in Slido, but is this strictly better for everybody? Or is it possible that it could actually decrease performance for some folks? Um, so yeah, I, uh, there's, there's obviously no guarantees. Of course. Uh, yeah. I, I have no, I, I don't know what you guys are doing. And so <laughs> you um, better not, you better not know. Yeah. What... <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, there's, I mean, obviously no guarantees that trading on the new target right. will improve your scores. Uh, I mean, you, you have 10 accounts to play with. One thing you could always do is just have the same model trained on both targets and, uh, so you basically have this, you could just sort of see the target effect going yeah, forward. That was something that was talked about in Twitch was that, you know, I, I would love to do that, but I would need an additional 10 spots for me to be able to do the A-B test to see sure. is it strictly better or strictly worse. And then, of course, yeah. I'd have to wait a while to see what it looks like. And yeah, then, of course, exactly. I could just switch the submission files if I was confident, right? Right. Um, I just say that because Anson's here now, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I mean, there's, uh, it's, it I mean, this target is a better representation of the thing that we are trying to all predict. Right. Um, and so, um, on average, it should be better. Right. Like on average, it should be, uh, and that's why it generalizes so well to the old target. Um, because it's, they're fu both fundamentally trying to, uh, represent the same thing and this right. just represents a little bit better on average. Yeah. You're not giving us new training columns. You're not changing the distribution of the, of the training columns. You're not doing anything in regards of adding new eras. You're not changing the number of eras. You're not, you know, like that nothing is changing with the feature columns. I, I, I say that for the audience and, and people listening. And after the fact, this is strictly a replacement of the column of the targets or our Y dependent variable. This is a modification or a distribution change or whatever you want to call it, but it's better reflective of what you all want to see from us. And so it's strictly better for you all. And if it is a better representation of market dynamics, then it should also be strictly better for us. But your mileage may vary. And yeah, and also there's going to be variance week to week where sometimes old target might be better. Um, I mean, yeah, just that's just the way things go. But on welcome average, to the stock market. Yeah, exactly. So, but on average, it is. I mean, because it's a better representation, um, it is better. Yeah, yeah. Um, any anything else you want to say while I pull up the the slide of questions? My Tabs um, tabs. Yeah, so right now, uh, so I I, I'm going to try to get uh, the new target out just as a separate file people can download and try to get, put an announcement up um, through email on the website over the next couple of days. Um, and uh, we wouldn't we're uh, we wouldn't do like an official transition probably till like the end of October. Right. Um, so that would uh, and we'll we'll give we'll give uh, plenty of notice. But even if you did make that transition, it you could you should be able to just keep your compute as is because the features are the same so yeah and you the, may the, not benefit from using the new target column but you also may avoid any benefit from retraining so i think it's important to be clear that even if you did add this new target and that you preferred that we used it that doesn't mean we have to and it doesn't mean that it would break our compute architecture no, exactly. But uh, when when we start scoring, that's uh, so what I was saying by the transition, we would eventually start scoring on the new target. Um, and at that point, I, I think there will be obvious benefits for retraining. And uh, yeah. Only if, it's, only if the live stock market better yeah. performs based on that target. So that, that's what I mean, though. Like, it's, it's an open question as to whether or not our predictions will improve on the live stock market based on yeah, it's uh, for, for sure. It's uh, so yeah. You I mean, and it's it's so co it's correlated enough that even if right. you didn't change your models and we started like started scoring on the new target, um, it wouldn't be that bad. Like I I was just saying internally that like if we had changed to the new target, started scoring on the new target, 
uh, now and didn't tell anyone, no one would notice. <laughs> right. And I think that's my point, right? Yeah. So while some may consider this as a, a breaking change, which we've talked about before, limit the amount of changes that, that you make on us. This isn't. This is not a breaking change. This is a feature addition of anything, not a feature. Wait, I have to be careful with my word choice. This is... <laughs> This isn't a feature for training. This is a feature of the tournament, if you will. This is an addition. It could be helpful. So I, I feel like a lot of the confusion or the discussion was circling around the fact that if I have to redo my pipeline, I'm going to be kind of ticked off. You don't necessarily have to. But based yeah. on your evaluation and having worked on the data, also based on your experience with the tournament, you're saying that this is a beneficial addition and everybody should just retrain on it. So let's talk about yeah, how right. we would go about doing that. Because if you sent us a, I, I don't even know how, honestly, I don't know how you do it. Send us a different tournament and training file with the column replaced so that all the the size of the data set was the same. Like that would be my preference, but please in Twitch chat and in, in Zoom chat, if you could, how, how would you prefer to get it? I think that's probably good to pull people. Yeah, I think that's, it'd be great to get your feedback. Um, yeah. I mean, for, for the initial great sort of uh, like release, I'm thinking of basically just uh, putting up a tr uh, one file, like a parquet file that has train and validation in it. Feels bad, man. Can't use Feather, huh? Uh, I, I think like parquet is just a little better supported. ITs. Across ITs. The platform. Yeah. It's all good. Uh, it doesn't matter. However you give it to us is better than exactly. CSV uh, file. <laughs> I mean, someone was mentioning an interesting format I'd never heard of, like Czar, uh, and that's, there's, oh, yeah, man. there's there's a lot of things. I mean, uh, basically, I, I would say if, if pandas can't go, like, to, to it in one line, that's not going to happen. Right. No, uh, yeah, as long as it integrates well with, with pandas, I don't think anybody's really going to complain. It, it yeah. sounds very exciting. Um, I'm all for it. If I can, if, if my sharp goes up, that means I have the potential to make more money. I'm happy with that. Um, and it, I'm hoping also, I would just say this is speculation on my part, but generally speaking, when something new comes out, the people who move quickly will, will, may, may get MMC from doing so. Yeah. So I would just say that, uh, there is a first mover, potentially a first mover advantage. That is my speculation. So that's, being yeah, clear that's on that. uh, it's possible. And, and, yeah, no. And I mean, and to, uh, and yeah, and I, I'm planning to retrain my models yeah. on it um, and uh, update some of my bigger, bigger staking models because uh, I know it will move the meta model in the right direction. <laughs> well, no, and, and the, the bottom line is the better the meta model does, then the better everybody does. It's the positive feedback loop that we're all trying to spin up and, and, and make it stronger so anything we can do to make the meta model better helps all of us and so uh I, i'm for it i just don't want to break people's pipelines so yeah i i, I don't want to yeah uh, there's, there are people who probably won't be able to update their models potentially for a couple of months depending on what their workflow is like if they're traveling you yeah. know who, who knows yeah. uh and, and in this case it wouldn't break it it wouldn't punish them it just wouldn't yeah. help them and so i'm okay with that yeah, that's that's sort of the way I felt about it. I was trying to wanted to make a change that uh, gives people plenty of time and is as non-breaking as possible. So yeah. I think I think we've accomplished yeah. that as well as possible. So I am gonna stop filibustering. Let's uh, let's talk to some folks. So I'm gonna just look at Zoom chat real first. Uh, Permistero, any? Oh wait, no, actually, Thomas Motz had the first question. Is the old target generated using? Marco Lopez de Prado's triple barrier method from advances in financial machine learning. No. No. I don't, I don't know how to follow up on that because I, sadly <laughs> I have not read the book yet. I don't read for fun. All I do is read academic papers. So yeah. the last thing I want to do is read even more. So that's, that's how that goes. So for Mysterio, any problem with the method used in the introduction of validation two? a forum post with the new data and eventually introduce it in the standard data set zip. I don't remember how you guys introduced validation too. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I think, I think there was a forum post. Uh, yeah, I should have put together a forum post. Was it a separate uh, zip file available at the time? I, I think maybe that's yeah. how it was initially released. Yeah, it was just as a separate file. Um, I, I don't recall. 
exactly. Yeah. That was before I joined. <laughs> Let's go to Slido. So the, the most upvoted question leading into this was when new core plus MMC leaderboard? Uh, that soon. Yeah. Soon. It's very soon. Cool. I mean, you're, you're giving us the uh, percentile ranks using it already. So I imagine that's pretty close. If you can do that in the email, I got to imagine those metrics exist somewhere. Yeah, that's cool. I like the emails, by the way. I think they're very fun. And you see how people share them after we get them because we're like, feels bad, man. Or like, ooh, look what I got. Thanks. That's turning out to be a pretty cool thing. I like it. One, um, of, our, one of our measures of success is whether or not people feel good about them enough to share them on Rock Chat and Twitter. We still haven't gone Instagram yet. Yeah, I don't, I don't have Instagram. You're not going to see me there. I did post on Twitter, though. Uh, all else being equal, our models train on the new target always better than those trained on the current targets. And then a follow on, does blending old and new models make sense? Um, I mean, yeah, like I said, I can't guarantee that. Right. Uh, I mean, there's, yeah, there's no guarantees in life. Um, but uh, in, 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 uh, in, yeah, in my testing, it seems so. And like, you could blend it if you wanted to. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think there's a super compelling good reason to do so. Uh, I think, yeah, just retraining uh, will set you up for the official change and will should help already. Yeah. How will you test on live data that our predictions made using the new target are more useful? Some people will train on the old target, some on new ones. Uh, I mean, because because it is representing fundamentally the same under underlying signal, um, they should just blend nicely together and it will just gradually move the model in the right direction as people switch over. Are significant differences between validation mean and feature neutral mean representative of the quality of the model? And if so, is there a minimum ratio to aim for? Um, validation mean and feature neutral mean. Um, well, representative I, of quality. So uh, like if you have a small difference between the two, is that a good thing? If there's a huge difference between the two, is that a bad thing? And uh, if, if it is good to be I, close, then what, what, what should we aim for if that's demonstrable? Well, I think it's, it's more a question about how much risk you're willing to take on. If, you're, uh, if your validation mean is much higher than your feature neutral mean, that means you have a lot of feature exposure. Um, which means you have a lot of feature risk and your model is fairly linear in the features. Um, okay. So uh, that's, that's, that's what it really means. So yeah, I, I think I'd s seen some of John Chafe's models that looked like they had very high feature exposure, like 0.6 or something, um, which means it's taking a lot on a lot of feature risk uh, for uh, a, a particular feature. Mm -hmm. So um whether or not that is good is an empirical question, uh, but I wouldn't do it. <laughs> yeah. I think the, um, yeah, one way of thinking about the feature neutral mean is like, that's your, that's, that's the score you get when you take on no risk, kind of, you take on no feature risk. So if that's, be that's clearly better than uh, returns that come from risks, returns mm. that come from no risk, are much better than returns that come from risk alpha uh, yeah so i think that's the thing to do to work on and and i'm sure anyone who has made a model with lots of feature exposure has seen how badly wrong they can they can go and it's very much like not in your control it's not like someone thinks well yeah i have a lot of feature exposure but i know this feature is going to work for the next year how do you know that um why would you know that how could you how why would you yeah why would you uh, bet on that anyway yeah so it is like somehow a lot better we all want to tell everyone you know you all all models will be feature neutralized by us um and uh, you're not allowed to take on any f feature exposure we don't want to go that far because it's up to because there there could be a case for taking on a little bit here and there but your feature neutral score is always going to tell you yeah. how much, how rich your model is in actual alpha. You've even said that 100% feature neutralize is maybe not the best 
way to do it anyway. So some feature exposure is good. It's just, you know, don't be a degen and go all in on one column. You yeah. know, maybe that's a bad idea. Yeah, I mean, you some like uh, the person, wait, uh, the person who was at the top of the leaderboard for a long time had a ton of feature exposure and it is a way to basically shoot up and down the leaderboard very quickly. <laughs> volatility. Yep, that's a great uh, volatility. I I try to tell people that that's not good, but uh, you can see it every day in the rank in the rank jumping, and, and you know that's fine. You know people are going to do what they do. Has Numerai seen a significant jump in average participant validation metrics after the release of the new diagnostic section? So, like, have you seen people tweak based on this, and then has the performance improved? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Uh, it's looking really nice. Um, Anson asked me in the beginning of the quarter to prove prove to him that user growth helps us at all. Hmm. Yeah. He had some user growth goals, and he was like, "You got to prove that. We got to get the data to show that more users help, more stakes help." Um, and because the diagnostics make the average user more aware of what they're doing and um, improve themselves. Uh, the meta model performance of since March has just kept getting better. Um, and it's, it's, it's a very noticeable large effect. More correlation, more sharp, um, everything's getting better. It's kind of cool. Uh, what kind of improvements in our predictions do you think the new target will lead to? And then an expansion of that better at predicting extremes, better overall spearmen, like where, where, how does it uh, play out? I guess is the question. Um, well, so the, the new target uh, has a different distribution. Uh, so the, the extreme values, the zeros and the ones are going to each only be 5% of the tar of the targets per era. Um, whereas before they were each 20%, so it's, uh, and the, the, uh, 0.25s and 0.75s will each be 20% and then zeros will be 50%. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's, in terms of correlations, it, uh, the models seem to do about the same, like almost identically, uh, but, but with lower volatility, which is perhaps your in lower volatility in terms of your score, which is perhaps surprising considering that you have these rare targets that uh, are, uh, I mean, that you would think that would add volatility, but it, in terms of scores, it actually seems to decrease volatility. But I think that's because it better matches uh, what you're trying to predict. And the previous targets were perhaps had two, the their, uh, extreme bins were too large and in including things that uh, shouldn't have been in them, perhaps. Neuralink's launch was bland. It feels that in order to have groundbreaking brain-computer interfaces, we need significantly better interfaces. Is this correct? I, yeah, uh, interfaces, um, it depends on what you mean by that, but I will interpret that question in my own way. Uh, and interface between technology and uh, wetware, that is the problem. Um, Basically, sticking wires in the brain is, is not very good for the brain. <laughs> um, and the brain doesn't like it very much. And You we'll, don't say. And we'll tend to basically put essentially scar tissue around the wires, uh, which will uh, degrade how well they can interact with the tissue. Um, and uh, electrical, I mean, the uh, people, I mean, the brain is sort of electrochemical, but just putting sort of... Uh, electric currents into the brain is a very crude way of interacting with neurons, which are these tiny little things uh, that have these incredibly uh, like sophisticated uh, ways of integrating information. Um, it's, yeah, it's very, uh, it's, it's, it's very primitive at this point uh, in how the, the technology interacts with the brain. Uh, so just getting better biocompatibility of the interface with uh, with tissue is one of the most important things that people haven't talked about enough for, for brain computer interfaces. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's an incredibly hard problem, but I, the thing I do like about the neural link is they're actually trying to do the right thing, the hard thing, which is get inside the head. Anything 
the the skull is an incredible insulator, uh, electrical insulator, and so trying to get oh. brain signals through through the skull is incredibly difficult um, and basically not going to work. Uh, you um, just like the uh, the, the signals from your muscles on your face are orders of magnitude larger electrically for things placed on your skull or on your scalp than anything through your skull. So uh, it's, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> the, the brain is very well protected inside your skull and getting inside there is the right way to talk to it, but just the sort of dumb material science problems are <laughs> one of the main limiting problems. Well, that's pretty interesting. Uh, a, I didn't know the skull had such a big component of the electro protection stuff. You know, I don't think of it like that, but I learned something today. That's kind of cool. I just figured it was like literally a helmet. That's, that's all I thought your skull was for. Yeah. It's, just, it's just your brain's helmet. That's all I thought it was. I mean, I don't, yeah, I don't th think it. There weren't like electrical things people had to contend with too much to made it a particularly good insulator. It just happens to be. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> that's what evolution came up with. Yeah, so somebody's asking me, Anonymous, when feature neutralization tutorial on Twitch? Well, if I didn't blue screen to death my computer every time I tried to do it, I would do it soon. <laughs> I'd have to debug that and figure it out. Uh, so let me figure it out, and then I'll come back to it. I think the, the, the next thing is I think I'll do a clean install from Windows 10 on a new computer. New is relative. I'm just going to wipe my old computer, hook it up to my live capture card, and stream it that way so i'll just go from like a base install of windows 10 put on cuda put on conda and work it all the way up to training with the data on gpu all the way through setting up a compute to having that whole thing done i think that would be a multi-part step so um michael oliver's been working on some new way to optimize feature exposure did you talk about that michael I haven't, but yeah, I will. So I, um, I have a, uh, basically a, a function I've written um, using PyTorch uh, where it will fit a, um, a linear thing, uh, a linear model for every era, uh, sort of like what the feature neutralization code does. Because the feature neutralization code is basically just uh, fitting the linear model from the features to your predictions and then subtracting off uh, some or all of that. Uh, this is basically a way of, um, of doing it. So you fit a linear model for a target maximum feature exposure. Um, so basically you can say, I want the max feature exposure to be uh, like say 10% uh, and it will decrease, it will keep your feature exposure to everything either the same uh, if they're at, uh, if, they're, uh, if they're lower than 10%, they'll either be the same or lower uh, or, uh, and the ones that are above 10% will come down to 10% or lower. Uh, did the change from three to 10 models per user help in this way? I, I, I lost this one. I think this is further back. This is before Anson hopped. Uh, so like when the, when the model, I guess is, I'm guessing, sir, please feel free to clarify, but, uh, when we could add more models, did the meta model improve too? That would also speak to the, does more users strictly help question? I think, I think that's what, what that's about. Yeah, it had to do with Richard talking about more users being useful. Yeah, well, we don't we don't know some of these things are happening at the same time. So we have the diagnostics come out at the same time as a, someone adds a new model or whatever. So it's hard to know, but I do think it's all helping. Why do convolutional neural nets and LTSM neural networks, why don't they work very well on the Numeri data? Uh, I, I can't answer this. I don't know. I mean, I would say that they're not, I mean, Every algorithm you use has an inductive bias, um, and you can just because you can fit it to data doesn't mean it's a good uh, thing for generalizing. And so, I mean, if you're using convolutional neural networks, you should be thinking that why do I think there's some kind of invariant structure uh, along the dimensions I'm convolving? So, like in an image, um, it makes sense that the same feature would be useful at this place in the image and this place in the image and all throughout the image. So you're convolving, you're learning a feature that works well across the whole image. Uh, which is a thing that makes sense where you have in this case you have a set of features um, that are in no particular order and so why why what dimension would you convolve over um, and 
convolving over time, you don't know how the, uh, the you don't know the correspondences across eras. So you can't really convolve over time. Um, and so I, I yeah, I, I don't think convolution, for instance, is a, and it doesn't make sense to use on this data set because uh, it doesn't have the right biases. Uh, and LSTMs, you still, uh, uh, it is a time series problem to some degree, but you don't know the correspondences again. And so making an LSTM work seems, it seems fraught at best. Isn't it disingenuous for Michael Oliver to post a little tweak to sklearn.time series split on the forum and claim he has open sourced his model? <laughs> um, I'm not, I, I'm not sure how, uh, I mean, I, I gave you guys the exact code that I used to create the model. Right. Um, and by, I even gave this, the same parameters that I do a search over, mm -hmm. uh, and there's no, there's no benefit for anyone else to have more than that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you can yeah. find you could find you could, you could do the search and find the same model yourself, um, but uh, and that that doesn't benefit anyone from learning anything or trying anything different. Um, I mean, yeah, I could put up I could put up pickle files of the original of the same model, but I don't want that. That right, doesn't I, help me. I think the important thing is the yeah explaining yeah the, how it was found or the code. Right even in the open source community that's what is meant by that yes all right everybody have a great day scores are out so check out how your models did all right guys see you